All right. Let me just take a sip. All right. <clears throat> so now, as you all know, my name's Melissa. Uh, a tiny bit about me. I'm Dan Bell's wife. Uh, I met him almost 21 years ago, and we became happily married 15 and a half years ago. Together, we have four kids, all girls, ages 14, 11, 9, and 2, with a few birthdays coming up soon. So uh, if you guys would all like to just put us down on your prayer list, please, that would be lovely. Uh, very much appreciated. <laughs> um, if that wasn't enough chaos in our house, we recently added two male German Shepherd Labrador Retriever puppies. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, they're currently about four months old. Dan had to get his boys somehow, so. Uh, <laughs> they're two lovable uh, handfuls that like to act like big, tough dogs, but also being held like little babies. Um, I'm currently volunteering as the kids' ministry director, <laughs> as well as teaching the first through fifth grade kids a couple of times a month, Colin. <laughs> Uh, and so even if you don't know me, I'm sure that you guys have seen me running around on Sunday mornings, usually with like a, like a chicken with its head cut off. Uh, I am horrible with names. I think that everyone should wear name tags. And when Sophia showed me these, I was so excited. Um, so don't take it personally if I've forgotten your name or will forget your name. Um, my kids can attest that I don't always get their names right, the first or second, or as Lily said, third or fourth uh, times. I would blame it on mom brain, uh, and I'm sure that's got to be part of it, but I attribute most of it to all of the useless knowledge that filled my head in my youth. So it quizzed me on pop culture of like the late 80s through the 90s, and I may not win, but I'm definitely going to place. Uh, I'm also socially awkward, uh, inappropriate at times, and most might think I'm shy until you get to know me. Uh, I never thought that I would be in this position, <laughs> standing here in front of all you guys. Uh, let's see, I was saved quite late in life. I already had two of my girls. Uh, so, but looking back, I'm reminded of all the other times that God has placed something in my life that I didn't expect to be doing. And yet here I am again, surprised, to find myself saying yes to speaking in front of you. But God knows, and he places us where we need to be. Life in our house is always loud and oftentimes very emotional. Uh, while I don't have a sister, I have been told that the cyclical pattern of fighting and being friends is normal. Being able to experience it and watch them figure it all out is interesting to say the least. It's a constant reminder that girls are mean. <laughs> we are petty and hold grudges. We can be spiteful and manipulative. We know just what to say to get under someone's skin. We are quick to judge and quick to form opinions based sometimes only on a look. We can tear someone down, leaving wounds that no one can see, but they stay with us for years. We are also loyal, loving, caring, kind, and compassionate, and can be great supporters of one another, being fiercely protective Giving confidence to others, reminding us that no matter what, we are not alone. Lifting each other up or simply being there when needed. My family moved to the Inland Empire when I was nine and a half. I moved onto a street where almost all of the kids were girls, which was quite a departure from the street I grew up on where I was the only girl. Uh, I know it's a little shocker that I'm a tomboy. Um, <laughs> now, once school started, I hung out with uh, one of the friends of one of the girls that were living on my street, which was yeah, pretty sweet, right? New kid, instant friends. Yeah, I quickly realized that that group wasn't the best. About every week or so, the majority of the girls would decide somehow that they didn't like one of the girls and they would kick them out of the group. My role in this group became the one who would go off with the newly ostracized girl. And she would decide that we were now best friends. But not just best friends, best friends forever. So about a week later, the group would welcome the girl back with no mention of any wrongdoings, uh, stripping me of my newly acquired BFF status, but all would be right in the world again until the cycle of nastiness began again. 
After making some other friends, I was able to remove myself from that group of mean girls, leaving nothing with, uh, leaving with nothing but the motivation behind the third grade poem, Two-Faced Friend. As we all grow up, we hopefully move past this behavior, but it never really seems to leave us completely. It just shifts. Sorry, there's a big old ant there, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, it just shifts. Showing up in that side eye that you might give someone. Uh, that looking up and down at an outfit that you might find to be too much or maybe not enough. Uh, only hanging out with the few that you feel comfortable with. Never talking to someone. Walking past them without even a smile or maybe turning away when approached. It's talking about someone behind their back, even if it's under the guise of, we should pray for her. It's the looking straight ahead while the person on the street stands there holding their anything help sign. It's speeding up so the car next to you won't cut in front of you, uh, not following the zipper approach to traffic. Maybe ignoring that text you got, uh, telling yourself, you'll get back to it later, but we all know you're not going to. Uh, maybe screening your phone calls because, you know, who, knew, who uses the phone anyway when a text will suffice? It shows up in so many little things that are considered normal that we hardly realize that we're being mean. Um, that what we're doing goes against what we're supposed to do. Now, I've been called mean throughout most of my life, uh, despite the fact that I feel like I have a loving heart. I always get, what's wrong? And for a while, it kind of confused me until I realized that unless I have a smile on my face, I look upset. Uh, my resting face isn't the nicest. So now throw in me focusing on a task, and I've been called intimidating. I realize that it leaves people with the assumption that I don't like them, uh, that I'm ignoring them, that I'm mad at them, uh, and that now I'm one of those mean girls that I got away from in the third grade. So me focusing only on my crazy life, staying in my lane, head down, checking off my to-do list, it can cause issues, or at the very least, it keeps me separate from people that God has placed in my life. All of these things are common problems and no one is immune. It's only when we open our eyes to the problem that we can start working to correct it. So when I read what text I would be speaking about, I had to chuckle because you see, God knows. So the themes that run through are things that I've been trying to instill in my girls for years and it seems like more so lately. Things like loving others, showing compassion even if you did not cause the issue having patience, caring about others, going above and beyond what is expected, that we can only control ourselves and our actions, that it doesn't matter what other people do, uh, you worry about how you act, and that the God who made you also made the other and placed us together for a reason. They're all very familiar topics to me, and it shouldn't be surprising that this is what we all need to hear. All these things contribute to the idea of unity. This is something that we all crave. Over these next couple of days, we will be blessed with messages that will hopefully empower us to live a life of grace, a life filled with unity. I look forward to hearing, to hearing Sheila, Margie, and Carrie speak about different facets of a grace-filled life, how we need each of these things to be able to have unity with not only our church family, but unity with all we encounter. The focus of my message is love. Without love, unity is simply unattainable. The bridge to unity is love. So without love, you can, you can never get there. You might see it, you might be able to witness it from afar, but without love, you can never be in it. The type of love needed here is transformative. To transform is a complete or major change in someone or something. When we talk about this type of transformation, it's a complete change for the better. With God, we will live radical lives changed against our natural will. You can only experience this transformative love through him. It is through the renewing of your mind, through putting your entire focus on God. You are transformed through prayer, through reading and reflection on God's word. It is through the worship of God, through the relationship that we have with him. It's loving like God loves us. It's loving our neighbors as God intended us to. God made the two greatest commandments about love. Jesus says in Matthew 22, 37, 39, he said to him, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That makes it pretty clear how important love is. We are to love God with every part of us because that's how he loves us. He loves us unconditionally. He loves us sacrificially. God sent us Jesus who lived his life here on earth, experiencing everything that we do as fully human. Jesus humbled himself, becoming a servant, expressing compassion to those in need. He was patient and kind to all, even when he was tested, even when he was taunted, when he was spat on, when he was crowned with thorns, when he was beaten. He continued to show this love as he took up his cross, knowing fully that he was walking to his death, knowing fully that he did no wrong, that he led a sinless life. He continued to love so that we could be forgiven of our sins and have that relationship with God that we were made for, so that we could have that unity with God and in turn, unity with one another. Now, Christian or not, this is a common want in our society. It's something that's talked about in popular culture often. Artists singing out loud, crying for this need of of unity. Rihanna sings, Told you I'll be here forever. Said I'll always be your friend. Took an oath. I'm going to stick it out to the end. Now that it's raining more than ever, know that we'll still have each other. You can stand under my umbrella. You can stand under my umbrella. Now every Thursday night, we were reminded that when things went wrong... I'll be there for you when the rain starts to pour. I'll be there for you like I've been there before. I'll be there for you because you're there for me too. And well before that uptown funk came around, Bruno Mars let us know that if you ever find yourself stuck in the middle of the sea, I'll sail the world to find you. If you ever find yourself lost in the dark and you can't see, I'll be the light to guide you. We find out what we're made of when we are called to help our friends in need. You can count on me, like one, two, three. I'll be there. And I know when I need it, I can count on you, like four, three, two. And you'll be there, because that's what friends are supposed to do. We sing that you've got a friend, as well as you've got a friend in me, and that people will stand by you, and we should try a little kindness. That people are one call away, and things will be better with a little help from my friends. And this is not a concept for adults only, as that part... (laughs) purple dinosaur sings, about people helping other people. And Doc McStuffins tells us about a helping hand, and we should listen to her because she is a doctor. (laughs) We were made to be in unity with each other. God has given us an example of unity in the Trinity. We have unity with God through Jesus. When we sin and no longer have that unity with God, we don't feel right with ourselves. When we don't have unity with our brothers and sisters, with our neighbors, we're going against what God wants for us. We are not meant to live, to live lives in isolation. We are made to be one with another. We can all tell that something's not right or that something is missing within these relationships. What we're missing is that unity that we're made for. The Bible tells us this over and over The verses will be noted on the screen if you want to jot them down. Maybe. I can't see. David sings to God in Psalm 133.1, how delightfully good when brothers live together in harmony. Jesus tells us in John 13.34.35, I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus prays to God in John 17, 21. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. Paul Paul talks about this again and again throughout the New Testament. In Romans 14, 19. So then, let us pursue what promotes peace and what (coughs) what builds up one another. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, that there, will be, <coughs> that there be no divisions among you, and that you will be united with the same understanding and the same conviction. 2 Corinthians 13.11, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Become mature. Be encouraged. 
Be of the same mind, be at peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Later on in Ephesians 4.32, And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. And in Philippians 2, 1 through 4, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in the Spirit, intent on one purpose, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourself. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. These are just a few examples of God telling us how important unity is. Our text today is Luke 10, 25, 37. So let's open our Bibles as we read a well-known parable, the Good Samaritan, as it gives us a better understanding of what God's love looks like. Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He asked him. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus took up the question and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, Go and do the same. So every time Jesus uses a parable, you know he's about to reveal some truth to his followers. We start our passage with an expert in the law, someone who should already know the answer to anything he could ask Jesus, which is confirmed with the words, to test him. Jesus was used to this, being questioned and tested by religious leaders. This certain expert asking him, what must I do to inherit eternal life, thinking he could try to trip him up? But Jesus turns it around and asks him, what is, written, what is written in the law? Basically saying, you tell me, Mr. Expert. So this guy answers correctly. I picture it in my head like that know-it-all in class, whenever the teacher calls on them, uh, maybe sitting up a bit straighter, head held just a little bit higher, uh, knowing that they're right, and they get to like show off in front of everyone, and if you are a know-it-all, then I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, So he answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus uh, responds with what I feel is like a verbal pat on the head. You've answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. Basically giving him like, yep, you already know this. Just do it. Now at this point, the whole exchange could be done. But this expert in the law, he doesn't drop it. He wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus for clarification. And who is my neighbor? Probably thinking like, ooh, I got him now. So Jesus responds with this little story. Starting in verse 30. A man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. So the story starts with a man. That's it. No other information about him. Just a man traveling down a road. While the story starts with him, he almost becomes unimportant. If this were a play, the man has now become a stage prop. 
The road, however, this was a known road. Mentioning this road specifically would have alerted those listening to him uh, that it was a dangerous road for this man to be traveling on. The road that go, uh, this road that goes down from Jerusalem to Jericho was 18 miles long. 18 miles descending more than 3,000 feet, which is just more than half a mile. Looking at the phrase going down, Jerusalem, being higher up, is considered a semi-dry area. They experience some moisture as the clouds move across the landscape, but the road that goes to Jericho is barren. The majority of the trip is desert-like conditions. Nothing's growing, just dirt and rock. So as if 18 miles going downhill with no shade in a desert wasn't bad enough, this road was also known for robbers. Now obviously going from Jerusalem to Jericho and back uh, would, make this road, uh, it would make this a major road for trading caravans, for people going to and from Jerusalem and whatnot. This traffic invites a bad element, and the isolation makes it a perfect place for people to hide rob you, and then escape off into the desert where no one's going to run after them. So hearing that this traveling man fell into the, into the hands of robbers would make sense. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. The listener would also know that if anything were to happen on this road, it would essentially be a death sentence due to the isolation and no elemental protection. So this man is now laying there with nothing, on the ground, desperate, a bloodied mess. At this point, the man's only hope for survival is that someone would come help him. Verse 31, a priest happened to be going down the road. Now, the priests were the ones officiating at the many offerings throughout the year. They were religious leaders representing the people before God. They obviously knew the law as they taught it. Now, this priest was going down the road, implying that he also was coming from Jerusalem. He probably had completed some priestly duties and was now going home. And while we think, oh good, this man of God's coming and will save the man. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now another thing about this road is that at certain points, the road is so narrow that if something were in the road, there would be no other option than to step over it to avoid it. The road never being wide enough throughout the journey that you wouldn't see a man lying there half dead in a state of disarray. For the priest to go to the other side was a conscious decision. Now, some say that the priest avoided him because he assumed the man was dead. And in order to stay ritually clean, he avoided him. Better not to have the inconvenience of having to go through the cleansing process than to help this victim, leaving him in isolation with no food, no shelter, or means to survive. Now, if only someone else would come along. <laughs> Verse 32. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at that place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So here comes someone else who works in the temple, someone else that knows the law, someone else that should have done something. But this person of faith disappoints us just like the last. While they each have God's word in their head, it is quite lacking in their heart. While... <coughs> Both the priest and the Levite saw the man. They saw the need. They saw him hurting with nothing to his name. They saw him alone, lying there exposed to the elements. They saw all of this, and they chose to step aside. They chose to remove themselves from the inconvenience, from the ugliness, from the dirty. They both saw and passed on by, leaving the man to die. Verse 33, but a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. We are led to believe that none of these men know our beaten traveler. The priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan knew nothing about this half-dead man. If they did, this parable would be irrelevant. To see a family member, to see a friend in desperate need, not many would hesitate to help. But this man, this unknown man, was just a stranger. There was no ties to this man, nothing connecting him to any and all who just pass on by. While we don't know if our traveling man was a Jew, it's important to note that the Samaritans and the Jews didn't get along. John 4, 9 sums it up, Jews do not associate with Samaritans. That seems pretty black and white. While they both followed the Pentateuch, 
that's where the uh, that's where the Samaritans stop. They rejected Jerusalem and all traditions and institutions. So if a Samaritan were to be in Jerusalem, they would be viewed with suspicion and hostility by Jews. And considering the back and forth issues between the two, that hostility was probably warranted. They are also known as the ones who robbed the Jews as they went to Jerusalem for their holy days. So Jesus' listeners at this point probably just had their minds blown with those three words. He had compassion. Now, compassion is defined as sympathetic pity or concern for the suffering or misfortunes of others, as well as to recognize the suffering of others and then take action to help. So there it is, what the man finally needs, action. This man from Samaria took action, not knowing if the helpless man was was a Jew or not. Remember, the robbers stripped him and they took all he had. They beat him until he was half dead. That leads me to believe he was pretty unrecognizable. He was left with little to distinguish who he was and what he believed. This Samaritan looked upon the man and simply saw a man in need. He came up to him purposeful. He had the same choice the other two had, saw the same need, but he recognized the suffering and took action. Verse 34 He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. The Samaritan chooses to do the opposite of what the others did. He went over to him. He was on his own journey. He clearly knew it was an inconvenience to stop and help this man. He also would have known about this road and the risks it posed. So him stopping to help puts him in potential danger of becoming the next victim. And yet he puts all this aside. He took care of the man's physical needs first. The traveler was beat and bloodied. The Samaritan knew that this is the immediate need, so he cleansed and disinfected the man's wounds. He bandaged the wounds, slowing the flow of blood. He made it so the wounded man could be moved from what had been his deathbed. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. He gives up his animal, knowing the man needs it more, knowing that he would most likely not make it if he didn't have that support. He recognized that in order to take the man out of this isolated, barren place, that he would have to walk, that he's going to have to give up his comfort and potentially even suffer himself. The Samaritan had to do this to fill the man's next needs a shelter, food, a place to heal. The Samaritan brought him to an inn. He gave him shelter. He gave him comfort. Then we learn that the Samaritan took care of him. And while we don't have details, we can all imagine what this consisted of. Food or beverage, maybe something, uh, maybe finish cleaning him up, right? Changing bandages. Maybe just telling someone, uh, maybe just someone telling him that things would be all right. Maybe giving him reassurance that the man was no longer alone, that he would no longer be left out there open to hurt, that he was safe, and that the healing could begin. Verse 35, the next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. So the Samaritan stayed with him overnight, caring for the man. At this point, he has met all the man's immediate needs. He helped the wounds. He gave him shelter. He gave him nourishment. He provided comfort. The traveler just needs time to heal at this point. The Samaritan recognizes this and provides it as well. He enlists the innkeeper, paying for the man to stay there and heal for as long as it may take. Nowhere in this story does it say that the Samaritan demanded the traveler reimburse him. He does all of this out of love, out of kindness, out of humility, and out of compassion. Verse 36, 37. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. So Jesus wraps up this parable, asking our expert in the law, which of the three men proved to be a neighbor to the traveler? The expert answers the only way that you can after hearing that story, the one who showed mercy to him. Jesus tells him, go and do the same. 
He tells the expert to do the same, but it's also a call for us to do the same. When we see the need, we ought to respond with compassion, respond with action. We need to follow God's command. Romans 13, 9 through 10, the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and any other commandment are summed up by this commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. While lying there, the man's needs never changed. He laid there waiting on the verge of death. Two men walked past, two men of faith, religious leaders with complete knowledge of the law. They walked by and they showed the true state of their heart. It wasn't until the third man comes along with compassion shown to a stranger, humbling himself, putting himself at risk, inconveniencing himself, being gentle and caring, being patient to someone who could very well be called his enemy. It wasn't until then that the desperate man could finally receive help, that he could get out of his situation, little by little, until no help is needed. Now the question is, how do we have that kind of compassion? How do we love everyone, even our enemies? Well, alone we can't. Our sinful nature simply won't allow us to love like God loves us, to love selflessly, sacrificially. In order for us to experience this transformative love, we need to be right with God, to be one with God. 1 John 4.11, dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. We need to seek forgiveness. God's love forgives. We never have to pretend or hide the truth from God. He already knows. We can be open and transparent with God. He loves us regardless. He is love. Jesus' sacrifice was the greatest expression of that love. And as we are called to be like God, to love like God loves us, we must grant forgiveness to others because we have been forgiven. We must have humility. It is freedom from pride. It is putting others before yourself, serving others. Philippians 2, 3 through 8. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourself. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of, hu of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Now, this is a hard ask because we are selfish in nature. But once you start focusing on God, you're going to notice that that me, me, me attitude it begins to shrink. It'll be easier to focus on others when we're focusing on God. We must have patience. Now, this one is pretty difficult, right? <laughs> we can probably say that on average, we're pretty patient. But, like, really? Patience is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, uh, trouble or suffering, without getting angry or upset. Now, I know that when I'm trying to get my kids out of bed uh, in the morning, I can accept a delay because I'm fairly used to that. But can I do that without getting upset? <laughs> when that happens, I will let you guys all know. <laughs> I was warned pretty early on after being saved, oh, you pray for patience, and God is going to give you ample opportunity to practice it. But it's something that I strive for, as we all should. And the only way to do that is with God. We are reminded in Proverbs 14, 9, a patient person, person shows great understanding, but a quick-tempered one pr promotes foolishness. We need to show patient, patience with others. They will ruffle our feathers. They will upset us with minor and major things. They will unsurprisingly fail us time and time again. And we need to be there because they are struggling just as we are all struggling, and they need someone. We can overlook a lot of things with God's help. In order to fully love our neighbors, this is what we need. We need, gent we need gentleness. 
This seems like a no-brainer, right? Be nice, be kind, be gentle to others. Unfortunately, just like almost every Bible story I teach on Sunday mornings, when it comes to the no-brainer things, us sinners are going to get it wrong. So we're reminded again and again. For example, Titus 3, 1 through 2. Remind them to submit to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid finding, and to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. And in 1 Thessalonians 2-7, through Paul shows us how he treated others. Although we could have been a burden to Christ's apostles, instead we were gentle among you, like a nurse nurtures her own children. That word, nurtures. We all need some of that in our lives. Someone to come along by our side and be there with us, cheering on our successes, providing motivation when needed, supporting us in our failures, and admonishing us when we get in some trouble. Using the imagery of a mother holding her child's hand, uh, this quote by Gary Thomas from Focus on the Family makes complete sense of how we all need to show gentleness. Gentleness is a strong hand with a soft touch. It is a tender, compassionate approach towards others' weaknesses and limitations. A gentle person still speaks the truth, sometimes even painful truth, but in doing so, guards his tone so the truth can be well-received. Now, this is something that we try to tell our girls all the time. It's not just what you say, but how you say it. The tone of your voice can reveal your true emotions. We need to have compassion. Compassion comes into the English language from the Latin root, and I'm going to say that it says paseo, but Jeremy's not here to help me, so, which means to suffer. Paired with the Latin prefix com, meaning together. So compassion is just to suffer together. Now with compassion, we do need to have empathy as well. Empathy is our feeling of awareness towards other people's emotions. Attempting to understand how they feel, whereas compassion is an emotional response to empathy, creating that desire to help, that need to take action. It's not just telling someone that you care, it's showing that you care by actually being there when they need it. Galatians 6.2, carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. 1 John 3.17, If anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need, but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? It is natural for us to see others and display the emotion back at them, mirroring them, happiness for happiness, joy, laughter, silliness. It's all infectious, right? The same goes for sadness. We mirror it, though, as a means of relating, of comforting. We see these behaviors in little children just learning to emote. God calls us to do more, though. It's not just the, oh, that's so sad, with the head tilt, the slight frown, as though you then go about your day as if nothing has happened. God calls us to take action. This is something, again, that we can only do consistently with God. Taking action for friends and family is almost expected. But that person that you don't really know, that person maybe that's mean to you, these are when we need God. If we are right with him, we can be compassionate to all. We want unity, and the way to get it is through the transformative love of God. But are you willing to do what it takes to attain it? Are you willing to be like that Samaritan and not only see the need, but take action? Are you willing to inconvenience yourself? Put yourself at risk. Get messy for the sake of unity. Are you willing to humble yourself? Putting others' needs before your own. Are you willing to be there not just for the quick fix, the short term, but to stay for the long haul, to be there regardless of need, regardless of the time frame, regardless of the potential cost? Are you willing to do this for all? The only way to have humility, patience, gentleness, and compassion for others is with God's help. It is with God's love that we Uh, It is God's love for us that we can have love for others. We must pray to God and be in his word in order to love like him. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. This is not a question for now. 
It's not even a question for us to answer while we're on this retreat, while we're all like pumped up and gung-ho. This question is going to be answered by our actions, actions of the next days, weeks, months, and years. But if we can do this, if we can all do it, it leads us to what we seek, what we crave, true unity as intended, unity with others and unity with God. It leads us to an overabundance of love for one another. It leads us to that overflow of these qualities that we seek. It leads us to love like God. If you guys can turn to Romans 12, 10 through 18, I'm going to leave you with this as the Bible sums it up far better than I ever could. And it might be on the screen, but again, I can't see. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Take the lead in honoring one another. Do not lack diligence in zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs. Pursue hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Let's go ahead and pray.